Good morning, men. We're doing a series called The Husband in the Mirror. This talk this morning will be a very important talk to some of you. Actually, it may be important to all of you. We'll see. But for some of you, this will be a seminal talk in your entire life. You're going to make some decisions this morning that will alter your destiny, I believe. We'll see if that happens or not. Um, According to Ron Blue, 11 out of 12 uh, people who have their spouses deceased are women. For every 12 people who have had a spouse die, 11 of them are women and only one is a man. Basically, what this means is that you are going to predecease your wife unless you're very unusual. You are going to die before your wife and you are going to leave a widow. Now, I received this week from the Social Security Administration a long sheet of paper that details how much Social Security income my mother received last year. My mother died on May 1, so she received four months of income. So if you wanted to know how much she received for the whole year, you would multiply this by three. Yes, $2,390. Her income last year was $7,000 annualized. Now, I frankly don't know how Social Security works, so maybe if, she, if my dad would have died first, she would have gotten more. So you'll know my dad's Social Security annualized for last year was $13,000. Hey, guys, that's not enough. <laughs> that's not enough to do anything. Now, I downloaded this morning from the Social Security Administration the numbers of widows and widowers in the United States and other countries All of these numbers could be very different, I don't know, but I suspect that at least in industrialized industrialized nations, they would be similar. The last year that the SSA has data available for is 1997, the most recent date. In 1997, receiving um, income from the Social Security Administration, there were widows... 4,829,456. About just under 5 million widows were receiving income from the Social Security Administration. How many widowers would you guess were receiving income, Social Security income? It's less than 112. It's 36,000. 36,000 widowers. And three million, four million eight hundred thousand plus widows. Men, <laughs> I didn't miss a decimal point. Men, you are going to die before your wife. You are going to die before your wife unless you are very exceptional. And so this presents a a problem that we ought to at least try to figure out how to solve. We ought to be taking a look at. And that would be the question, what is your financial duty to your wife? What is a man's financial duty to his wife? That's the question that I want us to take a look at this morning. Again, we are doing a series, The Husband in the Mirror. And this morning I want to explore with you a man's financial duty to his wife. First, let's just make a few observations. You have a listener's outline, so this would be point number one. The first observation is that money is important. When the tenth of the month rolls around, your landlord isn't looking for Jesus, right? He wants cash. Money is extremely important. In fact, my experience is there are basically three groups of people that think money is not important. Those who already have their money, they will be glad to tell you, oh, money's not important because they already have theirs. Or those who want to spiritualize about money, 
and say, oh, well, you know, we're Christians, and so, you know, money, money, is, money is evil, money is dark, and they want to spiritualize about money. And then the third group are those people who can't make any money, so they want everybody else to be just as miserable as they are. Those are the three groups that say money is not important. I would suggest to you money is very important, and it is a spiritual subject, and money is even... Yes, are you ready for this? Money is sacred. Money is sanctified or can be sanctified. There is nothing evil about money. Money is a tremendous blessing. If you have money, you know what a blessing it is to be able to have an orderly house. And if you don't have money and you are in financial chaos, and we all have been from time to time, you know what a curse it is to not have your financial house in order. Money is very important. That's observation number one. Observation number two, money is very risky. The scriptures tell us no one can serve two masters. For he will either love the one and hate the other, or else the other way around. You cannot serve both God and money. Mark 8 suggests, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Luke 12 tells us that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And so, looking around, I would suggest to you this, that all of the benefits of money are temporal, but all of the risks of money are eternal. All of the benefits are temporal, all of the risks are eternal. And so, and so, I would say that both prosperity and poverty are both great tests. They're both great tests. But I would suggest that prosperity is a greater test than poverty because the risks are eternal. So there's a tremendous risk that is associated with an overemphasis on, on money. Okay, if you would now, let's take those two observations. Money is important, money is risky, and let's take a look at God's Word. Let's see what the Lord Jesus has to say to us about this incredibly important topic of money. And what we're exploring again now is not the whole realm of money, but what is our financial duty to our, our wives. So, the second thing I want us to do then is to uh, look at the, uh, the Bible and some of the verses that would give us an idea about what our duty might be. Okay. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. You should be there. If you're not there, please turn there. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22 says, The blessing of the Lord brings wealth. And he adds no trouble to it. Where does financial blessing come from? Above. From God. Money comes from God, but it is not God. Okay, turn to Proverbs 13, verse 11. Dishonest money dwindles away, but he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. The idea here is, the, well, the subject is earning money, and you see a prudence here in the way a man would not go after get-rich-quick schemes, that he would pursue money little by little. Parentheses, my son and I have been having this, this discussion and uh, he, was, he was reading some of the Get Rich Quick books. And he was thinking, well, maybe, maybe that's the direction I should go. I'm just out of college, you know, I'd, I'd like to establish myself. And so he was thinking about going that way. And uh, through, 
the council, some friends, and several discussions, he's decided to go on a wiser path. He's decided to take this path, the, the, the Proverbs path, instead of the get-rich-quick path. Turn with me to Proverbs 21, verse 20. Proverbs 21, verse 20. So, wealth, money's from God. We should earn it with prudence, and then we should save some of it according to 21.20. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has to save. To put some aside for the future. Proverbs 27, verse 23. Money's from God. We should earn it. We should save it. And we should look after it as stewards. Verse 23. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks and give careful attention to your herds for... Riches do not, what? Endure forever. So we have a responsibility. We live in a fallen world. There are some wolves out there, some foxes out there. There's some folk who would separate a man from his money. Some of you have been separated. There's a responsibility to steward the resources that God entrusts. Don't love the money. i I would probably, if I had more time, do a a lengthy excursus here on debt. Those of you who have known me for a long time know that I've only ever tried to attach my name to one axiom. Everything else goes to the wind. I don't care who gets the credit for it, but this is Morley's money maxim. This is my original idea, and I want to make sure that I get credit for it. I have one, one maxim about debt, and here it is. Debt is dumb. I just don't understand why it does not occur to more of us earlier in life that it takes more energy to earn a living and service a debt than it takes to just earn a living. Duh. I mean, what's wrong with that picture? And you look at the Scriptures. I won't go through them, but look at Proverbs 6, one from Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1 through 5. If you put up security for your debts, if, if you have signed for neighbor, rush, plead, beg to get out of it, it says. Proverbs chapter 22 Proverbs chapter 26, Proverbs chapter 22, verses 26 and 27. I'll say it again. Proverbs 22, 26 and 27. Do not be a man who strikes hands in pledge or puts up security for debts, because if you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched from you. I think that's not that ambiguous, men. I, I, just, don't, I just don't think... You know, I remember myself, and, and that, that was the verse that that I got hung up on for a long time until I decided to pretend it wasn't there. But anyway, what I would do is I'd hold that sucker up, you know, and I, I can remember looking for a loophole on that verse because I wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted to build a business in the worst way. I mean, I really wanted to build a business in the worst way. And in order to do what I wanted to do as a real estate developer, I had to borrow money. I had to put up this agreement. And so I just kept... I kept saying, I'm not going to do it. I'm never going to sign a person. Never. And then the perfect deal comes along. And then I made this decision that this one time, just this one time, I will go ahead. And of course, those of you who've heard me tell this story before know that after that I signed regularly. Because once you, you know, kick, kick sand to, to cover the little line that you've drawn, you know, you draw this little line, then you kick sand over it, pretend it's not there. Well, once you've violated your own principles, it's just very easy There's very little barrier to not violate them over and over again. So anyway, I'm telling you guys, debt is dumb. Now, some of you have come to me for advice about debt, and I've told you this. And you've gone ahead, 
with your, your projects, and they've worked out. And I th- I'm thankful to God. You should know that I prayed that your projects would work out. And I'm glad that they did. But some of you are hearing what I'm saying today, and you think you're so much smarter than I am, that it's never going to happen to you. I have several young businessmen between the ages of 30 and 40 right now. That's not so young, but anyway, 30 and 40 years of age who I've been talking to have been asking me about my experiences. And I can tell, I know, I know what they're thinking. Every one of them is thinking, it's not going to happen to me. And I pray it doesn't. I pray it doesn't. But some of you right now are in debt and you're going to one day come to me and, uh, no, you're not going to come to me because you're going to be too embarrassed to come to me. But it's going it's to ruin, it's going to ruin the best years of your life, the later years of your life, because you have taken on a debt based on a future that did not happen. And trust me, <laughs> It's cyclical. I mean, just think about all of the geniuses who said, we have a new economy, this Internet economy. Yeah, there are new rules. There are new... No, there are no new rules. And now everybody's back to saying it again. There are iron laws of economics that, that, that apply. And so, anyway, that's my thing on debt. Debt, with regard to your financial duty to your wife, I think you have a, a huge responsibility to consider getting yourself out of debt. Now, what are all of these verses saying? Money's from God, earn it, save it, be a good steward. Uh, didn't even talk about generosity, but Luke chapter 12, in your time together at your tables, you can look up that one. These few thoughts on debt. What is Jesus saying to us about debt? What is Jesus saying to us about our financial duty to our wives with regard to money. I think if this is it, and this is the big idea this morning. I think this is what the message is. I think this is what our financial duty is. Have the courage to live today so that there will be something there tomorrow that are alive. I think that's the message. Men, we need to have the courage. It takes courage. We need to have the courage to live today so that there will be something there tomorrow that are alive. Dead, because you're going to die probably before your wife. And, or alive, because if you're not dead, you may be disabled. There may be a catastrophic illness. The ill effects of debt, all of these these things are potential looming disasters out there. And they all come at a point when? It comes at a point where you don't have the earning capacity to go out and rebuild it. The, young, the younger of us in the room are thinking, well, if I lose it all, I can rebuild it. Yes, thank God. Thank God that you can. Because that's what happened to me. I, I have been able to rebuild. But I tell you what. It could happen again, but it's not going to happen for any of the reasons we've talked about this morning. (laughs) Because I learned my lesson. I know that many of you have learned your lesson. Now, there are four lifestyles that, and we're going to start moving toward application. There are four lifestyle choices or spending styles, if you will. And these are generalizations, of course, that you can choose to live. The first one would be to live above your means. The man who is living above his means, for him, appearances are everything. It's important for him to look good. It's important to be driving the best car, living in the best neighborhood, wearing the best suits, wearing the best clothes. And so he's financed himself up to the gills 
Because Jesus isn't enough to make him happy. He really needs these other things to be a happy person. So on the outside, he looks rich. But when you get to, get to know him a little bit, you realize everything is financed up to the gills. You, you, you sense a little tension between his wife. What you don't know is that behind closed doors, there are fights and quarrels all the time. And this is a house of cards. It will come tumbling down in a little while. A little while, by the way, is 10, 20, or 30 years. Remember, a little while is 10, 20, or 30 years. I've been around long enough to see several people who were living above their means who made it work for 20 years. A little while. And then it all comes tumbling down. The second lifestyle would be those who live at their means. This is the, this is the guy... He's not foolish enough to borrow money for experiences that go away or depreciating assets, but neither is he wise enough to save for a rainy day. So he spends everything he gets. He doesn't have a retirement plan. He doesn't have a savings plan. There's a lot of tension in, in the home. There's a lack of contentment. The reason he spends everything he makes is because he, he has the sense that, that he needs certain things in, in order to, be, to make himself feel okay about himself. So he spends everything that he has. The third kind of lifestyle is the man who lives within his means. Now, the man who lives within his means understands that he is a steward of all that God has made. And so he does several things with his money. First of all, he has a good insurance plan. So that if there was a catastrophic illness, or if there was a premature death, that his wife would be taken care of. He does have some sort of a, a retirement plan or strategy so that through earning little by little and saving and all the scriptures we talked about, that he will at some point down the road have a, have a proper retirement set up for his, his wife. This is a man who understands that he has a responsibility to, to be generous toward the kingdom of God. And so he's a tither. And occasionally, perhaps he even gives a little bit more, but he, he's, very, he's very cautious to make sure that he gives 10% of his income first. And as a result, this man experiences a great sense of contentment. The third kind of man, uh, the fourth kind of man, fourth lifestyle, is the man who lives below his means. Now, this is the man in Romans 12:8 uh, who would have the gift of giving. This is a very special situation. This is a man who obviously could live at a much higher cut on the hog, but he and his wife have intentionally, because they have this gift of giving, they have intentionally decided to live out of a lower standard of living, uh, drive a 10-year-old car, and, and then they, and they just give the money they would have spent for the new car to Christ's work. And so they're having a... a, a they're having an impact all out of proportion to what one person might uh, ordinarily do. And there's a great sense of joy. They, you can tell these people, you can tell these people because they, they, you, they, they're walking around and they have this sparkle in their eye all the time. They, you know, honestly, I have never known a happy person who doesn't tithe. I, I, I don't know any truly happy people who don't tithe. I don't. And you know something on our board of directors? I've just this year made this a requirement. In order to be on the board of directors of Man in the Mirror, you have to tithe. You don't have to tithe to us. Tithe to your church. I don't care where you give the money. But, but, but I have found that if a man tithes, the rest of his life is in order. And if he doesn't, there's chaos. Now, you just, you just think about that. You just think about that. So those are the four lifestyle choices that a man can make. Most men really do think, and I'm not even talking about most non-Christian men, I'm really talking also about most Christian men. My, my own anecdotal experience is that most men 
And we used this as a big idea in a lesson. I remember because Jim Cunningham, you said that you really like this big idea, Ecclesiastes 7. The big idea was is that most men believe that money will do what it want and that God won't do what he will. I believe that with all of my heart, that most men think that money will do what it want and that God won't do what he will. The secret of contentment, men, the great secret of contentment, it's not getting what you want. It's wanting what you get. Yes? Yes. Well, let's apply it. You, uh, you've been going to this little diner now for about three years. She works the other side of the diner from where you always sit, but you've noticed her on several occasions. She's, hmm, what, 67, 68, maybe 70 years of age. Every vocation is holy to the Lord. And so being a waitress is a noble vocation. But, but you just have the sense that for some reason that this is not her natural place. She, there's, she seems to move with a certain sophistication. You, you suspect that, that her life circumstances were different, that she hasn't always been a waitress. And then one day it, it occurs to you, you know, I wonder, what is a woman her age doing working here in a diner? Why isn't she with her grandchildren? I'll tell you why she's working there. She's working there because she was married to a man who didn't take care of her financially. Have the courage to live today so that there will be something there tomorrow that are alive. Is it right? Is it right for a man to spend so much on his lifestyle today that his wife would be forced and maybe children to abandon that lifestyle if he should die prematurely, become disabled. To, to have to move out of the 4-2 and rent into the 1-1 the one one or the studio 1. Go back to work, baby. She hasn't been working. Most women do work today, but maybe she hasn't been. Well, actually, most younger women work. Most older women don't work. Go back to work. So you could drive a new car today. I don't think so. It's not right. It's not right. Have the courage to live today so that there will be something there tomorrow, whether you're dead or alive. That is the message this morning. Can you tell I feel strongly about this? <laughs> Have a friend, died, put papers in front of his wife last few years of his life several times. Those papers were basically co-signing unsecured notes that totaled $60,000. Not that much money, $60,000. He died. She's still trying to pay off those $60,000. You want to know something? She is angry at him. You know something else? So am I. <laughs> He's my friend. How could he do that to her? How could he do that to her? I told her, I said, you know, when we get to heaven, I'm going to hold him. You spank him. <laughs> and when you get tired, you hold him because I want to spank him too. Amen. All, all kidding aside, have the courage to live today so that there will be something there for her tomorrow that are alive, because that is your financial duty to your wife. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, wow, money. It's a great thing, Lord, to have it. It's a terrible thing to not have it. Father, our, our wives, even if they do work, are depending on us to fulfill our financial duties. Lord, I pray that you would take these scriptures, you would let them sit and do their work in our lives. And that because we revere you and your word, 
that we would come to the conclusion that money will not <laughs> do all the things we thought it would, but that you will if we follow your principles. And that you would help each of us, each of us in this room, every one of us in this room, to do those things that need to be done to make sure that we have provided for our wives in the case of our death, premature death, death, disability, or catastrophic illness, or whatever else might come our way. We ask this for your glory and your glory alone, Jesus. Amen.